gathered here this evening for the worship of Almighty God and be visiting here tonight, either in presence or online. We are thrilled to welcome you to this place at this time and for this purpose, to give ourselves to the worship of God. And we trust that wherever, wherever, you, wherever you are and whatever you're facing in life, that you will know God as your refuge, as your strength as your help in tight places, always close at hand. I love that Psalm 46, verse 1. The Hebrew makes bad English grammar. It says, God is for us a refuge and strength, a help in tight places, findable, very, which makes terrible uh, grammar, but fantastic theology. That the, the, the nearer the trouble, the tighter the place, the closer our God is to us and to his people. Even though he might not always seem to be close, as we'll hear in our psalm this evening, he's always there. He'll never abandon you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never cast you out or cast you off because of your trust in Christ Jesus. That's our hope. That's the anchor for our soul. And we welcome you this evening. If you don't know that hope as your hope, I'll be at the door afterwards. I'd love to speak with you and share with you just a little bit of who we are, what we believe here, and how you too can enjoy Christ as your Savior. He is the only name under heaven given amongst men by which we can, by which we must be saved. And if you call upon him, he will do for you what his name says. He will save you from your sins. Amen. And praise the Lord. Well, this evening we have a special delight of a prelude um, from Julianne Russell and Emily Creedle, and we'll allow that to prepare our hearts for worship this evening.
please, if you would, stand <coughs> for the call to worship. Praise the Lord, all ye servants of the Lord, who minister by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the sanctuary and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. Amen. Let's remain standing if we're able this evening. We'll sing to God's praise hymn number 700. Come we that love the Lord. your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts, to us. Our souls yearn, they hunger, they thirst for the living God. As the deer pants for streams of water, so our soul pants for you, O God. Our heart and our flesh cry out for the living God. For you are a sun and a shield. You give grace and glory, and no good thing will you withhold from those who walk uprightly. We dare not plead our own uprightness this evening as we stand before you, O God, but we stand and plead the uprightness of Christ, our mediator, the only mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. We pray with the psalmist, look upon the face of your anointed, O Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. See him as the Lord, our righteousness, as the shield of our faith, wrapped around about us, underneath us, and above us, O God. He has died in our place, and he has died for our sins. He has lived the life we ought to have lived. He has died the death we ought to have died. And now, O God, rising, he justifies us, declaring that our debts have been paid. And because the grave, the debtor's prison, could not hold him, it shall not hold us. And so we pray this evening, our Father, that you would draw near to us, You'd wrap us round about and underneath with a sense that you know the way that we take, that when you've tried us, you'll bring us forth as gold. Yes, there's much fine gold. Help us there then, O God, this evening, and bless us and lift up the light of your shining face upon us. For Jesus Christ's sake we pray. Amen. And amen. Well, we'll be considering together Psalm 13 this evening, and we're going to sing it now in our um, worship. You'll find the words printed in the bulletin. And if you're able, please remain standing as we sing together.
Well, good evening, boys and girls. How is everyone doing this evening? Good, I'm so glad. Well, we have a doozy tonight. We have a short question, but a very long answer. And this comes from our children's catechism number 86. Now, ordinarily, I have you guys say the answer with me. But to maybe save a little bit of time, I'll read the answer for us. So our question is, what is the second commandment? And the answer is, the second commandment is, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, let's see what I have tonight. Who can tell me what this is? It's a coin, that's right. Who can tell me, do you guys know who is on this coin? Just call it out, who knows? No, he's on the penny. This is a quarter. George Washington, that's right. Now, why do we have George Washington on the quarter? Just call it out, why do you think? He's our president, that's right. And so we put the image and likeness of George Washington, our president, on our coin in order to honor him and to honor his memory and all that he did for our nation. Well, boys and girls, do you know that each one of you tonight carry the image of somebody? You carry the image of God in you because when God created us, the Bible tells us he made us in his image, in the image of God. And do you know what part of this commandment is teaching us? It's teaching us that because of our sin, sometimes we try to make God in our image, in the image that we think he should be in. So we see a bird in the sky and maybe we think that, oh, this bird is like God. I'm gonna make this image of this bird and honor that as God. Or maybe a fish from the sea or a cow. And God says, no, none of those things represent who I am. And so there are wrong ways for us to try to worship God but God tells us to worship him in the way that he has given us to do that in scripture. And how does Jesus say it? He just says that we must worship God in spirit and in truth. And so we come to God not trying to think up our own ways of who God is or what God is like, but we worship God according to who he has told us he is and what he has told us he is like. And do you know who who God is like? Oh, I kind of spoiled it. (laughs) Jesus, when we look at Jesus, we see God. Jesus says that I and the Father are one. And in the New Testament we read and it calls Jesus the image of the invisible God. And so, When we want to honor and worship God, we don't do it in our own way or in ways that seem convenient or right to us, but we do it according to God's way. And God's way is through Jesus. Okay, well, let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for Jesus, for sending him to save us. Help us always to worship in the way that you want us to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let us stand and continue singing the final two stanzas of How Long Will You Forget, My Lord.
before we pray tonight, I would like to share some wise words on prayer from Charles Spurgeon. Spurgeon said, to pray is to enter the treasure house of God and to gather riches out of an inexhaustible storehouse. So let us now make our way to the Father's treasury in prayer. Now, O oh my God, let your eyes be open and your ears attentive to the prayer of this place. Our Father, we humbly approach you tonight, for we are sinners. Every intention of our hearts is only evil continually. Our inclination to sin, and it is the sin of mankind. Indeed, it is our sin which sent our Savior to the cross. Thanks be to you, O Father, and to your Son, our brother Jesus. For by his work, his work alone, all who know him, those who call on him as their Lord, are saved. We humbly beseech you, Father, forgive our sins and restore us to newness of life. O Father, as we consider your loving kindness, your grace, may we be duty bound. May we make it the chief end of our lives to glorify you through obedience and service. You, Father, are our creator, provider, and protector. You are the one who sustains, enables, comforts, and encourages us by and through your Holy Spirit. By all rights, you are worthy of our love and our praise. So then, Father, put it in our hearts and minds to commit ourselves to this course, to honor you and hallow, you name, hallow your name, to submit to your reign, to be obedient to your will. I ask that you give every member of this body a spirit of love for each other, as well as those outside the fellowship of believers. Make us compassionate people, full of mercy. Give us over to doing good, not for the praise of men, but that you would be seen and receive the glory befitting your name. Father, give us the mind of Christ that we might not conform to this world, that we might not be crippled by worldly cares. Let us never bring dishonor to you. Help us not only to believe on Jesus for our salvation, help us to believe Jesus, take him at his word and trust his promises that we might be secure in daily life, free from world worry and fear. Remind us of his peace, which surpasses human understanding. O oh, Father, bring us to awareness of your constant, enduring presence, so that we might walk in faith from darkness to light. Bring us to trust you with even the smallest details of life. Bind us to your word, that we might be unwavering in our commitment to truth. Enable our pastors and teachers, indeed, every member of this church, to be bold, courageous, and unashamed in proclaiming the truth of your word and sharing the gospel, even when it's not popular or comfortable. Particularly, Father, be present with our pastor this evening as he preaches, guide his thoughts, guard his heart, guide his words. As is, our, as is our custom, Father, I commend our missionary partners to you, specifically Lee and Joni Shellnut. Continue to bless the development and implementation of their work in Pakistan and Rwanda. Provide wisdom as they consider other areas of need, especially those in Africa. Bless their partnership with Erskine Seminary. Help them to train pastors and church leaders in accordance with the requirements of the Rwandan government. Help Lee to be a true Barnabas as he encourages team members. Finally, Father, we pray for the accomplishment of your great commission that the gospel be taken fully and finally to the ends of the earth, that your chosen ones might be baptized and made disciples of Jesus, that Jesus might come again in glory to establish his kingdom in the new earth. Indeed, Father, I pray that your original intent in Eden, which you have never abandoned and which you have faithfully shepherded through the ages, will soon be realized. 
Bring this place, Lord, the new Jerusalem, a place where your people, the church, will live in your presence forever. Come, Lord Jesus. So we offer this prayer to the glory of your name with great thanksgiving in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. And now the deacons will come forward to receive the evening offering. Father, we bless you this evening for your mercies to us that are new every morning. Because of your compassions, O God, that fail not, we are not consumed. We bless you, O Lord, that though we go through many tribulations to enter the kingdom of heaven, you do not willingly afflict the children of men, your people, O God. 
You send trials, but always for our good and for your glory. So this evening, Father, we come to yet another psalm in which the psalmist finds himself up to his neck in trouble and entirely divest of a sense of your presence. We pray, Lord, for your people this evening, some of whom are experiencing this sense of abandonment right now, and others of us will experience it soon. We pray, Father, you'll arm us for the fight and grant us faith and a light to brighten the darkness of our experience in the sure and certain hope that because you abandoned your only begotten Son, you will never abandon your adopted ones. We offer these prayers, O God, trusting your Son, who always lives to make intercession for us. Therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. Amen. Please take your seats. And if you would, turn with me in your copy of the Word of God to Psalm number 13. And again, please listen carefully. This is the Word of God. Take heed how you hear. To the choir master, a psalm of David. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Amen. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of God endures forever. May he add his blessing to his reading and his preaching this evening. Well, people have a nasty habit of putting preachers on a pedestal. It's kind of hard not to because we stand up here six feet above contradiction. You tend to assume that we are much better than the rest of you. We're not. You tend to assume that our hearts are much more naturally spiritual than the rest of you. They're not. And you tend to consume, assume that our communion with God, particularly our prayer life, is more glorious than the rest of you. And I'm here to assure you, it is not. You think, you think sometimes that when we pray, heaven opens, the angel Gabriel or perhaps Michael appear in the study, and what is thy bidding? And it's just a sense, and that's often not the case. I often feel Again, sorry, cockroach illustration. But I often feel like a cockroach on my back trying to get right way up when I'm praying. And I rather suspect you feel that way as well. And it's kind of important to know that. And I'm often asked, like for example by our interns, how much of that do you share from the pulpit? And there's a balance. It's a bit like Goldilocks's porridge. You can have too hot, too cold, and just right. And you can share too much from the pulpit, and then you can share not enough and then you can get it just right. And it can, be, it, can be, it can be difficult, but it's important because I want you to know that I have the same nature and the same struggles and I have the same propensity to commit appalling sins that are magnified much more than yours by my nature, of my, sorry, my office as a pastor. Let not many of you become teachers for you will receive a stricter judgment. I'm not totally sure what that means. It's like what Mark Twain says, it's not those passages of the Bible that are obtuse that I struggle with. It's the one that are very clear, that terrify me. And that verse haunts me, I have to say, even though I know I'm justified in Christ Jesus, my sins are forgiven. Yet James wants me to know that in the last day, while I'll say I will face no danger of damnation, but I will have a searching and probing examination of my thoughts, words, and deeds at a deeper level than the rest of the congregation. 
So how much do you share? It can be difficult. Sometimes there's a necessity to sharing. Remember one time back in Greensboro, it was around Christmas time, and I went to the front door, I forget why, but I went to the front door and I discovered an anonymous parcel of Christmas goodies had been left at the door. That was not unusual. What was unusual was the gifter did not ring the doorbell when they arrived at the door. And I wondered why. I pondered that for a while, and the answer wasn't too hard to divine. Shortly before that, 30 minutes or so before that, I remember my, my dog, Baxter, who's the fount of a thousand sermon illustrations, had been unusually stupid and stubborn. Now, stupidness in a dog is not unusual, and we can cope with that. And stubbornness in a dog is also not unusual, and you can cope with that when those two faults come alone. But when they come together at the same time, it can frustrate the patience of the best of us. And I remember telling Baxter in no uncertain terms he was to desist from this behavior, and it was never to happen again. But I used it in a tone of voice that I'd have rather kept private between me, master, and dog, Baxter. And I suddenly thought, oh no, I had visions of this kind lady coming to the door with her parcel and hearing me yell at my dog, and then taking the card out of the parcel and leaving the part at the back door, the front door, and then beating a hasty retreat. And it was rather embarrassing. And so later on, not long after that actually, I had an opportunity in a sermon to use that as an illustration. I can't remember what I was illustrating, but it was a good one. And I kind of let the congregation know that I'm a sinner, and that this particular woman was there as well. It also let her knew, know that I knew, and that this behavior was not acceptable. I hope it wasn't normal, and that I had repented of it. All that to say, right, it, it can be good for you as a congregation to know that we pastors are sinners and that we too have struggles. And the Holy Spirit seems to think that's an important thing as well, because you could imagine the Holy Spirit or an enlightened editor as he read through the Psalms thinking, no, we can't put in Psalm 51, that's too embarrassing. We've got to hide David's problems. And Psalm 32, no, that one's got to go too. And Psalm 13, we can't have the Psalm singer of Israel feeling abandoned. We've got to take that one out too. And you'd be left with a Psalter that was kind of all Psalm 150, you know, praise the Lord. Or Psalm 145, I will extol you, O God, my King. I will bless you forever and ever. Every day I will bless you. I will praise your name forever and ever for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and so forth and so on. And if that's all you had in the Psalter, you might be left thinking that David and the sons of Asaph and the rest of them lived in a higher spiritual plane than the rest of us. And that's not the case. And there are stacks, in fact, well more than a third of the Psalms are Psalms of lament in which the Psalmist feels himself profoundly distressed and worse, abandoned by God. And that should encourage you because if God has given you such songs in the Psalter, he expects you to use them and more than that, he expects you to need them. So when you feel abandoned by God, and you will sooner or later, there are Psalms like Psalm 13 and Psalm 22 that let you know that this is not abnormal that other Christians have passed this way before David, one of them, and that while these feelings come and while they, while they may last a jolly long time, they will not last forever and you're not alone in your suffering. Others have walked this way before you. I think that's an encouragement. At least it is to me. Now, Psalm 13 is about faith. The grace of faith the battle of faith. And faith is very much like the flashlight on the back of your cell phones. It is much more useful in the darkness than the noonday sun. And that's the lesson of our psalm this evening. What can we learn about faith in the psalm? And there are three lessons I want to draw from this psalm for you. First of all, notice the distress faith experiences. And you see it there, especially in the first two verses. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? David feels forgotten by God, forsaken by God, cut off from the friendly presence of God and from the smiling face of God. 
And worse, he feels he's been left to his own defenses. He's been left to think through his troubles in the lonely, abandoned, cold, dark echo chamber of his own heart. And to make matters worse, while David is down, his enemies are on the rise. They seem to be winning, and David is the proverbial loser. Notice the three dimensions of David's sorrow. First of all, Godward, inward, and outward. Godward, he's no sense of God's smiling face. How long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you hide your face from me? No sense of God's smiling face. Then inward, no sense of God's guiding hand. How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? He's, he's, he's alone, no counsel. In Psalm 16, David says, I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. Where am I? Um, I have set the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. That's Psalm 16. But David's experience is not all Psalm 16. Psalm 16, he's blessing God for that sense of counsel. He's sitting on the battlements maybe of Jerusalem on night watch, thinking, walking about, thinking, pondering some decision he has to make. And he's blessing God for counseling him. But he's also aware as he's thinking through the problem, his own mind is busy thinking through God's word and the problem he faces, the principles of God's word, the problems of his life. He finds his mind being drawn by the unseen hand of God in the right direction. Well, that's then, but this is now. In Psalm 13, David feels none of that. He's alone by himself. Abandoned, cut off, no sense of God's smiling face, no sense of God's guiding hand, and then his outward problems, he has no sense of God's saving power. How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Derek Kidner, ever a good commentator on the Psalms, says the third element, his enemy's ascendancy, would be dismaying at more than one level, not only as a personal humiliation. There's nothing worse than your enemies being exalted over you, rejoicing at your downfall. It's pretty bad, right? Not only as a personal level, though, but as a threat to his kingship and to his faith in God's justice. David isn't a private person. He's the king of Israel. And as he's abandoned, the people are abandoned. And that's bad in more than one way right? But notice the order of this three-dimensional sorrow. He laments a distant God and a distressed heart before he gets down to his defiant enemies. And I think there's a reason to that order. The absence of God is the worst trial a Christian has to endure, much worse than the presence even of enemies. And you see this again and again and again in the psalm, psalmist. The psalmist's top priority is not less of the enemy, not less trouble, not less difficulty. He wants more of God. And if your heart can echo with that, it's a sign of a lively soul and a good hope that your priorities are straight. And you know more light than you might feel in the darkness of your current trial. So first of all, then, the distress faith experiences. Secondly, the delay faith endures. To make matters worse, David isn't just lost in the darkness, but this darkness is going on and on and on and on. And he wonders, is it ever going to stop? Four times he says, how long, O Lord, will you forget me? Forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and of sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Plummer, in his study in the Psalms says the psalmist's darkness was enlightened by no ray of divine favor. His misery had no lucid intervals and this went on and on and seemed as if to go on forever and a day. 
Yet, even though every circumstance in his life, every dread in his heart proclaims God's absence, David is still searching for this God. He's still calling out to this God. He's still praying. He's still seeking God. He turns to the God who seems to have abandoned him. He asks God, do you see... Let me just turn on do not disturb. Thank you. Um, He asks God to take careful stock of his pain. He can't feel God. But that's not to say God can't hear him. And he prays to, even though he can't hear God listening, he seems by faith to know that God is. Consider means take a long, careful look at my situation. Consider and answer me, O Lord, my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. He's saying, Lord, look at my pain. And his instinct seems to be that the heart of God is moved by his pain. That God can't look at him and see him suffering and feel nothing. That God is moved as he looks at him. The instinct of faith. He's reasoning with God here. He asked God to give his eyes the light of hope, lest he sink into the darkness of death. It's like that old song, I'm so sorrowful I could die. Lest my enemies say, I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. Lord, can you look down at this state of affairs and say nothing and feel nothing and do nothing? My enemies, which by implication are your enemies, are about to rejoice. And here I am languishing in misery. Does that not bother you, O God? He's reasoning with God. There's both emotion in his prayer and reason. And the two go together like water and wet. Ralph Davis calls this the instinct of faith to search for the God who seems to have abandoned him. When God plays hide and seek, play along, look for him, search for him. It's like when your children hide from you, dads. They don't mean you to go, great, I've got, you know, know, a few hours to watch the Ryder Cup in peace. We just leave them hiding. No, you go looking for them. It's part of the game. Well, when God hides from you, he means for you to search for him. He's testing your heart to see how badly do you want him. But deep down in his heart, do you see, by this instinct of faith, David seems to know that his fears are not as true as they feel. There's a world of a th- theology in that statement. Our fears, Christian, when we're trusting Christ, our fears are never as real as they feel. Things are never as bad as they seem. Just because God is hiding doesn't mean God is forgotten. Spurgeon, in his Treasury of David, it's just a fantastic commentary. He says, we have been wont to call this the how long psalm. In fact, I almost called it the howling psalm from the incessant repetition of the cry, how long, how long, how long? A week, Spurgeon says, within prison walls is longer than a month at liberty, but a hidden face is no sign of a forgetful God. Isn't that wonderful? A hidden face is no sign of a forgetful God. Note the cry of faith, O Lord, my God. He's abandoned, but he can still say that, O Lord, my God. And when you can say that, boys and girls, he's my God, he's your God, you can say a very great deal indeed. My God. Is it not a very glorious fact, says Spurgeon, that our interest in our God is not destroyed by our trials and our sorrows? We may lose our girds, but not our God. The title deed of heaven is not written in the sand, but in eternal brass. 
Remember there was a time in my life when I felt, I was in ministry, and I felt entirely abandoned by God. I was at a low, low, low point. And I was walking along the beach at Myrtle Beach, um, totally downcast. And I was looking down at the ground, couldn't even look up, and I, I suddenly stumbled across this huge heart that someone had written into the beach. And the middle of it says, what, what God's plan has brought you to, his hand will carry you through. Right? It was like one of those tacky signs you find sometime on a marquee outside churches. But it came with the power of God in my, to my heart. There I was walking along this beach and for some reason some Christian had scribed into the sand and in letters as big as day what God's plan has brought you to. His hand will carry you through. And it was as if God himself had reached down and touched me. Our feelings are never as bad as they seem. And what's more, think about it. What does your doctrine of inspiration tell you about this psalm? The, the very moment David is lamenting the absence of the Spirit's presence, the Spirit of inspiration is filling him and giving him the words to write this psalm down. God is never as far away as he feels. The Christian is always more full of God than he is feeling in his heart. Remember that when God seems to have abandoned you and seems to have forsaken you. The distress faith experiences, the delay faith endures, and then lastly, the anchor faith embrace, embraces. Verse 5, but, David says, I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Again, David comes back to the word chesed, which is a very wonderful little Hebrew word, H-E-S-E-D, and we've, we struggle to translate it. Tyndale put it into loving kindness. He took two glorious words, loving and kind, and he welded them together, loving kindness. The ESV captures the idea of steadfast love. That's a wonderful kind of catch-all. But it carries the mind, as we said before, of God's stubborn, single-minded, steadfast commitment to do you good as his people. It's like that, 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 that scene at the end of Marcus Luttrell's book, Lone Survivor. It's a marvelous book about that awful time in Afghanistan when he and his four-man team of Navy SEALs were ambushed, you remember? They, they were discovered by a shepherd boy and his grandfather, and they debated what to do. Do we tie them up? But the wolves would come and eat them and so forth and so on. And they'd go back and forth. Do they kill them or do they let them go? And they debated and let them go. And then the, the two of them predictably ran down to the Afghan village where the Taliban were. And all hell broke loose on the mountain. And they and a rescue team of Navy SEALs were killed. And at the end of the day, um, Marcus Luttrell was left alone, crawling away. He was, he was blown up by an RPG that blew him over an escarpment of rock. He landed on a ledge, rolled in under an overhang, and was hidden. But he was almost mortally wounded, and he crawled for several days. He's read the book. It's an amazing story of determination. He was grievously injured at the point of death. And he describes this moment where he arrives at a stream, a mountain stream. He's, he's, his mouth is full of dust and blood. He hasn't drunk in several days. He's at the point of death almost. And he puts his head into the, into the stream, this ice cold mountain stream. And he sucks the water in and he feels the invigorating presence of refreshment. And then he lifts his head up and he sees three or four Afghan males with AK-47s pointed at him. 
and he thinks they're the Taliban and they're deciding whether to shoot me or not. And actually they weren't. They were Afghan Pashtun tribesmen who were deciding whether to show him help or not. And it was a pretty important thing because in that culture, and all cultures find their roots back to Noah, of course, and the flood, and the idea of covenant is deeply wedded into the cultural memory of human beings of every nation, tribe, and tongue. And in the Pashtun tribesmen, that cultural me- memory finds its ethos in a term, Pashtun Wali. I'm probably mispronouncing that, I apologize. But what it means is, once you show help to a person, be he your friend or your foe, you're on the hook for that man or that woman. And you are to defend him as a town. Once a member of a town shows aid to another human being, be they friend or foe, every man in that town is on the hook to defend that guest to the last man. And they decide to show him Pashtun Valley. And they bring him to the town. And they nurse him and they heal his wounds, of course. And it doesn't take the Taliban long to find out he's there. And you remember, um, if you've read the book or seen the movie, there's a scene whenever the, the Taliban come down with all of their guns and they say, basically, it's in the book more than the movie, bring him out, we're going to kill him. And this Afghan father walks out and goes, you can kill him if you want, but before you do, you have to kill all of us first. And there's a tense standoff, and the Taliban eventually turn and walk off. And that's, in a nutshell, what chesed means. That when Yahweh extends chesed love to you, the whole Godhead are on the hook. That they will defend you to the last man. Whatever price they must pay, whatever need of redemption you might have, they will pay the price. They will rescue you body and soul and they will keep you safe. It's like that time in the end of the Book of Flags of Our Fathers when Doc Bradley, who won the Medal of Honor in Iwo Jima, he was a medic, a corpsman in the Marines, and one of the other Marines, they were fighting before Mount Suribachi, which was this huge mountain that had been hollowed out by the Japanese and turned into machine gun nests and howitzer positions and mortar positions. And the Marines had to take Mount Suribachi. And if you've seen the Marine Memorial of the, of the five men lifting the American flag, on top of Mount Suribachi, it's a great symbol of American military might and American victory. But before they raised that flag, they had to win the battle, and it was a, it was a hellish thing. There was bullets flying in all directions, and Doc Bradley saw a Marine. He didn't even know him, but he was a Marine. was cut down by machine gun fire, and Doc, the medic, had to run out into essentially no man's land, and there were machine gun bullets coming from all sides, mortar rounds landing. He ran to the man, realized he needed a plasma infusion, took his rifle, shoved it into the ground, set up the plasma, and then cradled the man. He put his back to the machine gun bullets. So if anyone else got shot, it would be Doc Bradley, not the man. And he waited for that plasma to drain into him, and then he drags him back to safety into the, into the, into the trenches. And he did it because he was a Marine, and that man was a Marine, and there was an esprit de corps between the two of them. And that's a picture of Chesed. God the Son coming down, sent by God the Father, helped by God the Spirit to stand between you and the merciless, withering fire and fury of the wrath of God. And he cradles you in his arms and he puts his back to the bullets of God's just wrath that we deserved, but he received. And he was abandoned. He felt the full fury of Psalm 13 and verse 1 and verse 2. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? And in a sense, on the cross, 
The, the infinite person of God the Son felt the full fury of infinite, eternal, unchangeable wrath. And because of the dignity of his person, he was able to experience the full weight of eternal hell in those hours of darkness upon the cross. And he did that because of chesed. Because his father had extended chesed to you. And because he had extended chesed to you. And he would pay any price, face any problem. Experience any abandonment so that you would not have to. And so, you can see Jesus, the lad, singing Psalm 13, and again, readying himself for the appalling cost of our redemption. This is what their redemption will cost. What they sometimes experience in feeling, my son, you will experience in reality. You will be abandoned. You will face the fury of the wrath of God without a sense of the kindly, loving, supporting, undergirding presence of God. And so, Christian, this evening, you can lay hold of that too. When you feel abandoned, when you feel forsaken, when you feel that you've sinned yourself beyond the hope of mercy, you lay hold of chesed. It's a glorious golden chain wrapped around the aorta of your heavenly Father. And when you pull it, he feels it. It's a promise to you. You will never be forsaken. You might feel it, but you'll never be it. And so David rises up. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. And then in verse 6, in the climactic moment of faith, now remember, He's not felt the bounty of God yet in reality, but he feels it with certainty. So certain he can speak about it in the prophetic perfect as if it had happened, though it is yet to happen. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. There's no sense in the Psalm that bounty is David's now in experience. But by faith, it's his in reality. It's Psalm 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. You can't see them with your eyes, but you can see them by faith. The substance of things hoped for. You can't feel them with your hands. Oh, but you can wrap your arms around them by faith. They're yours. And it's never the strength of our faith, but the object of our faith. David puts his faith in the chesed love of God. It's like if the Almighty will forbid me for likening him to a dog, it's like owning a Doberman. They call Dobermans Velcro dogs. They never leave your side. Remember when I was thinking of buying my Doberman some years ago, Armani was his name, but it was a wonderful dog. But one of the websites that said, if you own a Doberman, abandon the hope of ever using the restroom by yourself again. <laughs> no matter how hard you close the door, he'll go in and he'll nose that door open and come in and sit on your feet. <laughs> well, if you have Yahweh as your God, abandon the hope 
of ever being forsaken again. He might leave you for a while, but he'll not leave you forever. Before long, his blessed hand will push open the door and he'll come in and wrap us round about and underneath with his everlasting arms and we will know the joy of singing to the Lord for he has dealt bountifully with me. Aren't you glad that the Holy Spirit hasn't hidden the dark times of David's life from us? He's given us songs to sing in the darkness. Wasn't it Wesley or Cooper, I forget, he says, sometimes a light surprises the Christian when he sings. It is the Lord who rises with healing upon his wings. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful psalm that speaks to us of our experience, but more it speaks to us of our Savior's experience who endured this psalm to the nth degree so that while we might have it for a moment, a light and momentary sorrow will not have it forever. He had the lake of fire upon the cross that we might have the crystal clear, refreshing streams of the water of life that flow from the throne of God forever and ever. We pray this evening, O oh God, for your people gathered here. And perhaps there are some here who feel abandoned. Every circumstance in their life proclaims that God has forgotten them, that God has forsaken them. Grant, O oh God, that you'd give them the grace by faith to reach up to that scarlet thread hanging in the window of your chesed love. You'll never abandon the men, the women, the boys and girls, you have pledged to love with an everlasting love. You will not stop, ever stop loving us because you never began to love us. You've always loved us from before the foundation of the world in Christ Jesus. Give us faith, O oh God, to believe that. And grant us the experience to know that, O oh Lord. And we can bear any trouble. We can face any foe. We can carry any burden if we just feel and know by faith that the God of heaven is our Father. His Son is our elder brother and redeemer. And His Holy Spirit is the one called alongside us to help us and to keep us kept in the betwixt and between as we live now waiting for Christ to come and make all things new. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand as we conclude our service this evening, singing to God's praise this glorious hymn that Dr. Cole has written. The hymn is an old hymn, but the tune is new and it's glorious. One there is above all others well deserves the name of friend. Let us worship God together.
now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit grant you to know that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen.